So thank you for the introduction. Um, as explained, I'm hoping to introduce um, uh, kind of Byzantine consensus protocol from the distributed computing uh, branch of computer science. And this can be used in a variety of D networks. A D network is a decentralized network. Um, of course, cryptocurrencies are decentralized networks, but many different kinds of decentralized network are possible. Um, my perspective on D networks is that the sweet spot is in between cryptography and distributed computing. Dominic, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, maybe this is okay. Just okay. Well, you can pick it up, and then you can pick up the mic. Yeah, I'll try. Okay. Sorry, is that better? Oh, it's not a mic. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, that explains it. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just to repeat, my, my belief is that the sweet spot for decentralized network design lies smack in between cryptography and distributed computing. And they're surprisingly um, different branches of computer science. So, uh, many cryptographers have no idea about distributed computing. And many distributed computing folks have no idea about cryptography. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a, an example of that. Um, one of the things that you need in distributed computing to uh, bring some nodes to consensus is a source of randomness. And you've had for sort of 30 years of people designing these protocols where you have something called a common coin. And a common coin is nothing to do with cryptocurrency, it's to do with uh, randomness, it's a source of randomness. And Last year, um, some cryptographers released a homomorphic threshold signature scheme, um, which makes it possible for a distributed group of nodes that first communicated on the internet to cooperate to create cryptographic randomness on demand. And you can combine this cryptographic randomness with these distributed computing Byzantine consensus techniques to uh, create some very interesting decentralized networks. Um, and that's just one of many examples of how the, the two um, branches of computer science can work together. And I think as uh, D-network, the area of decentralized computing generally becomes more mature. We'll see a lot more of people combining techniques. So <clears throat> why decentralized, sorry, why, um, why use a Byzantine consensus algorithm from the distributed computing branch of computer science? Um, it has different properties to, for example, Nakamoto consensus. It's strongly consist consistent. That means all nodes decide in a single protocol execution. It provides forward security. So once the nodes have decided on a value, there's no going back. It's not. Um, it can be very fast. So speed is a big advantage as long as the node count is is bounded. And. Um, but it has some, some limits too, and this is why Satoshi didn't use, use these um, protocols himself, although he was looking into them. Uh, it, you require civil proof identities. Um, you have some restrictions as well in relation to the number of messages that need to be passed uh, as, as your set of nodes increases. So how might, you know, <clears throat> How might something like Nakamoto consensus be combined with Byzantine consensus? So I think in the um, decentralized networks of the future where we want to process perhaps millions of transactions a second rather than the three Bitcoin can currently do, we'll start breaking the network up into different functions. And so in this diagram, we've got a global Nakamoto chain and the Nakamoto chain provides identities for the network. It provides randomness, and it provides a heartbeat. And uh, this is used by Byzantine consensus, numerous Byzantine consensus processes, uh, which sit on top of uh, storage and validation. And out of those come Merkle roots, which are stored back in the Nakamoto chain. So the Nakamoto, the, the blockchain here is just storing Merkle roots, that's it. It's, it's very lightweight. And it's, apart from that, it's, it has this other purpose too, which is generating IDs, generating randomness, and, and, and providing a heartbeat. So 
The talk outline is first to talk about identity and uh, how we might create civil resistant cryptographic identities. Once we've done that, we move on to uh, look at a binary asynchronous uh, randomized Byzantine consensus algorithm. And uh, then we look at two examples. Um, the objective is really just to try and provide some, uh, d d d to give you some understanding of modern Byzantine consensus techniques and some of the related decentralized networking uh, uh, issues. So we're going to start with civil uh, resistance identities. Um, just going back, circling back to Nakamoto consensus for, for a moment. The civil problem is that if you have uh, a network that depends on voting, where the, the different nodes have IDs and vote, and, and the network depends on voting, to uh, reach consensus. The problem is a civil attacker can come along and he can just add new IDs to the network uh, and unbalance voting. And Satoshi's solution was no identities, right? So instead of voting, he had puzzle solving. Puzzle solving is a kind of substitute for voting. And anybody that solves the current puzzle, i.e. creates a block, effectively casts a deciding vote. So that's how Bitcoin works. Gets rid of per node, per ID voting, and just has this kind of rule that whoever solves the current block, they cast a deciding vote. And um, Nakamoto consensus is eventually consistent because you need to resolve these the, the, the potential for competing votes. And uh, you know, as the chain grows and buries these things, it, kind of decides for itself. So there are three E's of civil resistance, and it helps to think about what civil resistance means. Um, the three E's of civil resistance are, um, number one, entry cost. How much does it cost to <coughs> for your node to enter the network? Number two, existence cost. How, long, how much does it cost for your node to stay in the network? And number three, uh, what's the exit penalty? Can the node be kicked out? And you can evaluate the civil resistance of any ID using these criteria. So the one that's not known so well, people are very familiar with the first two, but the one that's not thought about so much is, is number three. Uh, and so why, why do we have that third one? The reason for the third um, E, which is exit penalty, is you can make the adversary face potentially unbounded costs. Um, for example, uh, if you can expel a node, and you've got a node that's behaving in a Byzantine manner, if a cryptographic proof can be created of that uh, behavior, correct nodes can create those cryptographic proofs and, and force the Byzantine node out. Um, and in extremis, for example, if an adversary has gained a critical proportion of the network. Perhaps he now has a third of the nodes or half the nodes. Um, the correct nodes can collude and uh, literally just delete the um, IDs from the ledger, for example, in a fork. I mean, nobody wants to do that, but it means that you have the, that, that option. So, so Bitcoin currently has no E3, so it, it maximizes E1 plus E2. And it has this uh, absolutely colossal hashing power. Um, just like 300 petahashes at the moment. And a lot of the reason for that is that if an adversary ever did gain 51%, or actually more like 31 or 34%, um, the network's kind of screwed. There's no way of excluding that hashing power from the network. So the Bitcoin's solution is to just amass this absolutely huge uh, hashing power to prevent that happening. So, whoops. Yeah, sorry. So Nakamoto consensus is strongly 2E civil resistant. We have uh, entry cost. <clears throat> you have to buy the ASIC equipment. You have to build out your uh, mining hosting. You have existence cost. And there's this wonderful quote from uh, Chandler Guo here in the audience. Uh, so 
currently you need approximately 7,000 tons of water falling 100 meters in a hydroelectric plant in Tibet to produce one Bitcoin. So that's, that's the existence cost. That, that's how much it actually costs to maintain a presence in the Bitcoin network. It's very expensive. But you don't have an exit penalty. Uh, you know, an adversary can stay in the network as long as he has a sixth of function. As long as you can continue solving puzzles, as long as you can continue you know, hashing, you can stay in the network. So strongly 2E sub-resistant. So here's the, 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 the first kind of, uh, one, one of the first ways we can create more civil resistant identities. Um, Called these Nakamoto identities, very, very simple. And the idea is when you solve a block, you now include a new ID. Just like you include a Coinbase reward, you now include a new ID. Um, the IDs have limited lifetimes, so you can't just keep accumulating them ad infinitum. And we sort of get 2.5e, what I call 2.5e civil resistance out of this. We have the same entry cost as before. We have the same kind of existence cost, which is kind of amortized creation cost because of the lifetime. And we do have some kind of exit penalty now. Somebody can be forced out of the network early. Their, their identity can be banned, right? And they've lost it. If, for example, a cryptographic proof could be... Uh, you know, posted to the blockchain in a transaction that shows that an identity has done something bad and it can no longer participate. So we've increased the civil resistance by gaining the ability to expel some of these IDs from the network. So that's Nakamoto identities. Um, this is a kind of proof of stake approach. This is what I call surety bonded nodes. Very simple, somebody who wants to add a node, an ID to the network, just burns an amount of cryptocurrency to their ID, right? They can never get it back. They just burn that cryptocurrency to their ID. So now we have, again, 2.5e civil resistance. You have entry cost, because you've got to acquire the cryptocurrency to um, burn. You kind of have a weak existence cost. And, the weak existence cost is the opportunity cost of the capital you've burned. But, you know, once you've burned it, you, don't, you, you can't really change your mind, so it's kind of weak. And you've got an exit penalty, of course, that, that if you get kicked out, you've lost that value. Um, there's some proof of state weakness. What happens if the value of B collapses, right? Um, it might be that, you know, people don't care if their IDs get banned because the value of the cryptocurrency that they burned to create the uh, ID isn't very much anymore. So you can improve this um, a bit um, uh, using this thing called gated node entry. Uh, in gated node entry, people submit a join ID transaction to, to the ledger, and that just sits there in a pending pool. Your ID doesn't automatically get added. So you, your, your ledger, your distributed ledger, contains the record of all the valid IDs. As a distributed ledger might be a blockchain. Um, when you submit your join ID, you don't automatically get your ID. So in, in this model, periodically, the D network will pass certain capacity thresholds. For example, it might have a long-term moving average on transaction fees. And once those transaction fees pass a certain point, it might be that the ID is then inducted into the active nodes on the ledger. Um, and it creates some interesting properties. Um, the adversary is going to maintain, if, if the threshold is a third of the nodes, if the, advers the, the adversary must maintain more than a third of the transactions in the pending pool in order to reach a third of the IDs in the network. So, and, and by restricting access, you kind of magnify the currency value of the node and, and, and surety. And of course, a, a rush Sybil attack is very difficult now because the network is admitting new nodes uh, at its own pace. Um, for example, if it's using a long-term moving average uh, on, on the transaction fee, 
Um, yeah, you could you know do lots of transactions to try and increase that, but you're going to spend a lot of money doing so, and it's going to take a while. And, and while you're doing that, people might see that you're doing that, and they might start adding other joining transactions to the pool. So then finally, um, puzzle towers. So the idea here is to um, temporally bind anonymous puzzle-solving power to identities. So uh, this is an extraordinary photo um, from uh, Chandler's uh, factory. Um, and you can see Bitcoin mining machines stretching off uh, as, as far as the eye can see. And so the idea is, can you bind uh, these machines to cryptographic IDs so that if, <coughs> without any modification of the hardware, so that if these IDs get banned, then the hardware becomes unusable for some period of time. Um, and it sounds, you know, it sounds improbable, but it's, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, so a puzzle, using something called puzzle towers, a puzzle tower um, is effectively an, an ID with some associated puzzle solving power. So in Bitcoin, that's hashing. And even though a puzzle solving tower will only occasionally solve the global block, um, every single, at every single depth, it will have found some kind of solution. It may only have a small number of leading zeros in it, but it will have found some kind of solution. So a puzzle tower is just a record of um, the work that this puzzle solving power has performed. And the puzzle tower has a height. And the height is just a function on that record of work that's been performed. And so every single puzzle tower in the system, and you might imagine a network with you know, tens of thousands of these puzzle towers, every single puzzle tower has a record of the uh, puzzle solving work that it's done. And these might be compressed in various ways, um, which I, w I won't go into now. But in their interactions with the network, they present this proof of the height of the puzzle tower. So the function um, on the work is designed in such a way that the puzzle tower grows very slowly through pu puzzle solving work up to some max gro growth rate. So even if you put, you know, a hash into one of these puzzle towers, there's a maximum speed at which it can grow, right? The tower crumbles very fast if you remove the uh, puzzle solving work. So if you decided for some reason that you wanted to take your puzzle solving resource that's assigned to a tower and move it to a different tower, the height of your tower would crumble very, very quickly. And the tower loses height when it solves uh, a puzzle. I adds, adds a block to the global chain. So furthermore, the difficulty is unique to the uh, tower ID, and it depends on the height. This is just some example where you've got a difficulty proportion to the inverse power on, on the height. So anyway, with this uh, um, particular construct, you can um, tune the architecture parameters to control how much resource, puzzle solving resource, um, that an economically optimal miner will wish to associate with each ID. So assuming that miners are rational, they'll end up wanting to associate a particular amount of uh, puzzle solving power with each tower. And th this helps in, 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 in the design of D networks where you want to structure your network using lots of IDs. Um, and you know, there's, there's various ways that could be done. I mean, simply, I mean, the blockchain, for example, could just uh, award random IDs to each block. Um, sorry, make random awards to each ID in each block. Um, similarly, if you need an ID to participate in Byzantine consensus, then obviously you want as many puzzle towers as you can get. So puzzle towers exit penalty, you know, you're, you're, they're expelled upon proof of Byzantine behavior in the network. Uh, 
if they equivocate during Byzantine consensus. Um, and there are other potential applications. For example, you, know, you might have a, a voting system so that if you identified a, a, a particular miner's IDs were being used in selfish mining, potentially you could introduce a system where those IDs would, would be banned. And when those puzzle towers are knocked out of the system, the associated mining hardware is now economically redundant while it's building new puzzle towers. And you can design your algorithms however you like and make it arbitrarily long for, for a new tower to be built. So um, puzzle towers are three, resist three resistant. You, you, you've got um, this entry cost. You've got to buy the ASICs and build the mining environment. Uh, they've got existence cost. You've got this continual expenditure of significant electricity. There's no cheating. As soon as you take the electricity away and stop mining, your puzzle tower crumbles. Um, and you've got this exit penalty. If, if your puzzle tower is, is kicked out of the network for whatever reason, all of the mining resources are now economically redundant, right? While well, they're building a new tower. Um, so it's interesting to see anyway that you can you can take uh, you know Nakamoto chain and first of all build like a 2.5e civil resistant identities and then a 3 3e civil resistant identities. So uh, if I've convinced you that um, there are various ways you can approach the problem of creating civil resistant identities. Uh, the next step is to think about <coughs> uh, Byzantine consensus, because if we have civil resistance identities, we can now start running Byzantine uh, consensus protocols. Um, the ones I prefer use randomness. And randomness can be generated cryptographically, or it can be generated by Nakamoto chain. So we're going to look at um, binary consensus. Now, binary consensus. Um, looks useless, but it's not. So the, the, all of the participants in binary consensus uh, choose a value that's 0 or 1. And you might ask, what use is that? But it, it's a very short step from uh, binary consensus to multi-value consensus and a whole load of other systems. Uh, and we'll touch on some at the end. So <clears throat> one of the... Uh, Things you find with um, uh, one, one, one aspect of uh, Byzantine consensus in the distributed computing sort of theory is that there are a few precursors, and I think this this, this puts people off, but they're, they're not all that bad. One, one of them is that you need to choose your network model, and there are a bunch of different network models out there. Um, the three main ones are synchronous. Synchronous makes no timing assumptions whatsoever, and it, it's, it's, it, it's the one that I work with. And cr all that you uh, decide is that correct nodes will always deliver a message eventually. No assumptions are made about how long they'll take to deliver a message, right? Absolutely no timing assumptions. Synchronous assumes that correct nodes will always deliver messages within a known time. Um, and partially synchronous, uh, which is very popular, probably the most popular, um, assumes that networks can behave asynchronously for a time, some maximum time t, and then the, the network returns to synchronous behavior. So I, I, I'm a big promoter of um, people using asynchronous network models. And there's some really, really good reasons for this. For example, how can you reliably determine if some node, some quiet node, has failed or is in fact just, del is in fact just delayed? So just because you haven't heard from a node doesn't mean you can make an assumption that it's failed. It may be delayed by an adversary. It may also be an adversary that's just choosing not to send the message, right? You just don't know. It's very, very difficult to make timing assumptions. Timing <coughs> assumptions fail and um, they create vulnerabilities. And if you want to create a proof, you, know, you, you want to mathematically prove the validity of a consensus algorithm, it's very difficult to make um, synchrony assumptions because you can't really capture the internet. You know, the, the speed of the internet is not uniform. It's highly variable. And there are real risks to poor handling of a synchrony. So there's a link here. And, um, 
the failure of Stellar in, in the first instance with Ripple Consensus Protocol was actually predicted about three months before. And uh, the, there's a, a link to a, a post that details why they weren't handling asynchrony correctly and why it was going to fail. And it, it's amazing uh, how um, poorly asynchrony is understood. People just think, yeah, yeah, of course, you know, it makes sense. Why can't we have timing assumptions? I'm just going to run a protocol and I'm going to assume that all messages, all messages are delivered within a certain amount of time and have timeouts and things like that. Um, and there, there are many more uh, <coughs> complex aspects to asynchrony as well, some of which we'll, we'll just touch on in a, in a moment. And if you don't handle these correctly, um, you, you, you get failure. And in fact, Bitcoin has its own uh, problems with, with asynchrony, you know, and this is why we have problems with, you know, centralization, selfish mining, and things like that. Um, because, of course, it's not, when one of these blocks is distributed, um, you, you can't, you have to make a big assumption about how, how long it's going to take for that to, to flood across the entire network, right? And it floods the network at different speed. Different networks receive the block at different times. Um, so, anyway, Asynchronous is very, very important. Something else you need to know about is a thing called common coin. A common coin has got nothing to do with cryptocurrency. A common coin uh, is a shared source of random bits. And the way uh, it's typically designed is that these random bits are available on a Byzant when a Byzantine quorum of nodes requests them. So a common coin used just to be a theoretical construct, right? That has been around for years in the distributed computing literature, and uh, no one's ever created a system with, with a common coin, a working system with a common coin. But last year, um, someone came out with this uh, homomorphic threshold signature, which was deterministic, and, and, and furthermore that you could have a bunch of nodes uh, come together on the internet and run this protocol to agree the, uh, the public key, the, the, the shared private keys, and these validation keys. And once these nodes have performed this protocol, they can then generate cryptographic randomness on demand, right? And it's very straightforward. So. Each node, for <clears throat> each node, for example, would just sign a communications round, right? Say it's communication round 42. Each node signs 42, broadcasts it, and once you've collected two, you know, two th signature shares from two thirds of the nodes, doesn't matter which two thirds of the nodes, you can combine them and create this threshold signature. And that threshold signature is the same, irrespective of which, you know, from, from which nodes you collect those two thirds of signatures, right? So it's really an extraordinary thing. You, know, you can have this group of nodes, they can decide, right, it's time to generate some randomness. Um, they all sign the round number and broadcast their signature shares. And once you've collected signature shares from two thirds of them, you can then generate this threshold signature. So, and it, it's deterministic, it's the same for everybody. That means everybody has got exactly the same random bits. And that's extraordinarily powerful. With randomness, you can do all kinds of interesting things. So there's another thing um, which I won't go into here. There's a thing called a weak common coin. A weak common coin um, <clears throat> only provides probably shared random bits. And the reason this is important is there are some people uh, working on uh, consen Byzantine consensus protocols that can work with, sh with, with weak common coins. Um, and a weak common coin can be supplied, for example, by a very fast Nakamoto uh, blockchain. So final, I think this is the final, not quite, almost final precursor before we try and understand how consensus works. Something else you need to know about. You have two kinds of consensus algorithm. One has a leader, one is leader free. Uh, Again, you probably guessed, I prefer leader-free. And the reason is, how do, you, how do you determine if a quiet leader is failed or if it's been delayed? There's just no way of telling, right? So 
you have a number of synchronous leader-driven protocols like practical Byzantine fault tolerance is uh, um, very well known and is being used in various uh, decentralized networks. Um, and for example, you might think, well, it's got a leader. Right, if you want to delay it, you can attack the leader and you can put it into an endless leader election loop, right? As long as you can find out who the leader is, you can just attack the leader and it's always, the protocol is always going to be electing a new leader. If you yourself are elected leader, you can just delay sending protocol messages until the edge of the timeout windows, right? And you can just completely legally slow the entire network to a crawl, right? Uh, there's another aspect which I should have put in, which I forgot, which is that if you're the leader, you can choose what data, for example, what transactions the group of nodes is going to agree on, right? The leader has, a, has huge power. And that's the same in Bitcoin, of course, because whoever solves the puzzle is a leader. Um, okay, we, we, this is the last precursor. You may have heard about this thing, FLP impossibility. It's a very, very famous, probably one of the most famous results in computer science. And it's a theory that proves that deterministic consensus is impossible in the presence of a synchrony if only a single node can fail. Um, and so this is brought up a lot. So basically means that if, if you have an asynchronous network of nodes, right, and even a single one of them can fail, you cannot deterministically reach consensus, right? And I won't go into it, but there's, there's a kind of easy way of, of proving it even, just explain it. Uh, but you needn't worry about this theory too much. FLP impossibility is vastly overquoted because it says nothing about the probability that a synchronous Byzantine consensus terminates. And you can design protocols uh, that terminate with, um, <laughs> it's gonna be probability one, not probability zero. <laughs> you can design protocols that terminate with probability one, right? As the number of rounds uh, approaches infinity. Um, yeah, that's a one. So now we get to the idea which I'm hoping to kind of explain, um, which is uh, randomized uh, Byzantine consensus. And in fact, uh, synchronous randomized Byzantine consensus. So we start off with um, uh, the node chooses a value, which is, which is order one. Then it enters a loop, does some protocol magic. And in, in this loop, um, after doing some protocol magic, it, it looks at this condition, which is that some critical proportion of the nodes, including me, have voted for some value. Um, and after that, it does a coin flip. Uh, the coin flip produces a zero, one. And, and this is the key trick. If, if people concur, and if the value that people have voted for is the same as the coin, you can decide the coin. Otherwise, you set your current estimate to, to whatever it was voted for. And then the reason this works is that you know that if, if people don't concur, people adopt, people adopt the, the coin as their estimate. But, but sometimes, you'll see why this is quite difficult, sometimes people, it, it's not that everybody concurs, right? Just some set of people concur. But the great thing is that if some of the people, if you're one of the ones that can cut, right, and what you can cut on is the same as the coin, you can decide that because you know that the people who don't concur are going to be uh, adopting the coin as, as, as the estimate. And so through this common source of randomness, you can actually converge the notes. They end up agreeing and deciding the same value. Uh, the reason the coin flip has to be random is that otherwise an adversary can, can, can play games of mess message scheduling and things like that and, and stop this convergence. But this is the um, essential core of um, all, all these algorithms. 
So if we just look at our, look at our uh, actual algorithm, just a couple more precursors. Um, these, are, these are some of the um, key things you need to know, really. Um, the first thing is that the number of faulty nodes inside a network must always be less than a third, right? You can prove this. Um, there's no way of getting beyond this limit, right? The total number of nodes is equal to three times the number of faulty nodes plus one, right? It's just less than a third. Faulty nodes must be just less than a third. That's the limit. Um, that equals should have been greater than or less than a sign, but never mind. Um, the second thing you, you, you need to know is that <clears throat> whenever you have an asynchronous protocol, you always need to proceed without, the, uh, without that um, proportion of nodes that might be faulty, f. So you can see here that we must proceed with n minus f messages, which of course is equal to 3f plus 1 minus f, which equals 2f plus 1. This thing's actually known as the Byzantine core. And the reason is you can't wait for those last nodes because you've got no way of knowing that they're faulty. You can't set a timeout. You can't make any assumptions. And if you wait for this last third of nodes, that last third of nodes may be the adversary's nodes. They may be Byzantine. And they may just sit there making you wait forever, right? So you can't wait. You've got to proceed. As soon as you've received n minus f nodes, you need to proceed. And this has a kind of alarming implication, right? So we've had to proceed with 2f plus 1, uh, uh, you know, a message from 2f plus 1 nodes. But it may be that the f messages that we didn't receive, it may be that those messages were from correct nodes. And in actual fact, we've received messages from faulty nodes, right? So we only know that we've got f plus 1 messages from correct nodes. So we've only, which, which is tough, right? So I mean, we'll just flip forward. What this basically means is that the, the, the protocols must proceed in each round with correct messages from only approximately 34% of nodes. All right? And that's why these protocols are diff difficult. You'd think that you can just collect messages and, and, and um, do some kind of average or something like that. It just doesn't work. You actually need to be able to converge on consensus um, with this restriction that um, in each round, you may only have um, correct messages from 34% of the nodes, which isn't much, right, when you think about it. It's pretty limiting. Um, and that's just because, just to run through it again, because everything hinges on it, um, your, the, the total number of nodes in the network, n, is greater than or equal to 3f plus n, right, and the number of faulty nodes has to be less than a third. We don't know, once we've received n minus f nodes, n minus f messages, for all we know, the remaining, the, the remaining f messages we haven't received may take forever to arrive, because they may be um, from Byzantine nodes who are just going to withhold these messages and make us wait forever. So we, we can't proceed. We have to proceed as soon as we've got n minus f messages, right? We can't wait for this last f. We can't, because there's f faulty nodes, there's a maximum of f faulty nodes in the network, so we have to proceed. So we end up with 3f plus 1 minus f, which is 2f plus 1. Uh, uh, messages, this is known as a Byzantine forum. But of course, although we've got this 2f plus 1 messages, it may be that the f messages we didn't receive were from delayed good nodes, and we've actually received uh, messages from f faulty nodes, so we can only rely upon f plus 1 of our messages being from uh, correct nodes. Um, which gives us this thing that, this, this huge challenge that the, the pro protocols have to proceed in each round with um, correct messages from only 34% of it. So I think this is the last precursor. So the last thing you need to know about, this very important concept, is, is Byzantine quorum. So there are two kinds of quorum. A traditional quorum, everyone's heard of, right? 
A traditional quorum uh, it, it, is, it is a set from a, total, a subset from a total set um, of a size such that if you uh, have two quorums, you know that they'll intersect by at least one node. So um, pretty straightforward to work out what that is. It's, it's, it's the number of nodes plus one divided by two, um, round, rounded up. Right? So we have, we have each node right, is, is part of a set of n nodes. Right? A quorum um, is a combination of those nodes, and it has the property of this, this, this size property here. So one more than half a node. And so long as a normal quorum is that size, when you take two quorums, they'll intersect by at least one node. And obviously, if you have two quorums that intersect, you can um, run, for example, use quorums to run successive operations and chain things together. So a Byzantine quorum is really very much the same, except we've got this additional, this, this restriction that, that, that some of the, <coughs> we don't just want them to intersect by any node, we want them to intersect by a correct, intersect by a correct node. So a Byzantine quorum, two Byzantine quorums intersect by at least one correct node. And here we have it, in order to do that, we just take a normal quorum and just add f, right? And of course, that's going to approximate 2f plus 1. So as long as we have uh, messages from, you know, two quorums, each comprising uh, uh, messages from 2f plus 1 uh, uh, nodes, we know that, that those quorums are going to intersect in one correct node. Uh, so now I'm going to actually see uh, a real protocol. Um, and this is actually state of the art uh, at the moment. Um, I, I think it's the, the, the best protocol out there. Um, it's been by these guys. Um, Oshel is uh, an advisor on the Pebble project. Uh, Michel Reynolds is a very famous distributed computing guy. Um, the uh, Formatting, if you look at the paper, it's good looking at the paper, the formatting and the conceptualization is a bit different. It's taken from this thing called the proof of, proof of processing framework. Uh, but it's the same ideas. Um, and it provides optimal resilience and efficiency. And the reason, the reason this particular protocol is good is that you can run massively parallel versions of it that are very efficient. So, um, there are two bits to the algorithm. This is like a, 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 a sub-algorithm that the main uh, algorithm uses. This is called, well, I've called it, a amplified binary broadcast. And it's actually, it's actually quite simple, um, if, if you bear with it. So the input to this is that the node wants to propose a binary value, 0 or 1, in some communication around R. And the purpose of this uh, broadcast is to amplify um, amplify votes for a value that we know have been received, sorry, amplify votes for a value which we know have been, which we know has been voted for by at least one correct node, right? To amplify it to a Byzantine quorum, right? So, we start off up here that the node broadcasts to all the other nodes his uh, value and the wrap. And we have an event handler here, so we, we receive this broadcast value from uh, node J. And if node J hasn't already um, sent this, we're just checking here that, that we have already received this from node J. We add this value from node J to the receive set on line 5. And then on, on, on line 6, we do something. We, we, if we haven't already broadcast this value ourselves, which is this first bit here, right? We're node I. So if our value isn't the same as the value that we receive from node J, and this particular value now has been received uh, f plus 1 times. We then amplify it. We broadcast it again, assuming we haven't already broadcast it, to all the nodes. 
And what's happening here is that because we've received this value f plus 1 times, we know that at least one, one correct node has voted for this, for this value, right? Because there are, only, there are only f, there's a maximum of f faulty nodes. There's a maximum of f faulty nodes. So if we've received a value from f plus 1 nodes, we know at least one correct node is what do you mean there's a maximum of f faulty nodes? I thought f meant the maximum uh, number of faulty nodes that could exist without breaking the protocol. Yeah, it is. So, um, so what we're saying here is that um, if, if we've received if we've received a value votes for a value from a further nodes, right, and we know that. Less than the further nodes uh, must be faulty. That's, that's one of our assumptions. We we know that we can't work if, if we have more than uh, if we have a further node faulty. So we know less than the further nodes are faulty. So once we've received over that amount, a third or more votes for a value, we know that at least one correct node, according to our assumptions, has, has voted for that value. So once we're satisfied that at least one good node has voted for that value, if we haven't already voted for it ourselves, we rebroadcast it. We amplify it. With the result down here, that we, if we ever receive a value which has uh, two f plus one votes, uh, we accept it. We add that value to the accepted set. Um, and any, any value that um, is voted for by um, f plus 1 nodes will always eventually reach this state. And the, the, the thing is, the reason this is important is that faulty nodes can equivocate, right? So they won't necessarily send the same vote to everybody, right? So I could, you know, I, 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 could, I could tell you that I vote for one, I could tell you that I vote for zero, right? So the purpose of this is to allow nodes to form a common view uh, on, on, on values that have been voted for by at least a single correct node. So this doesn't have any, actually doesn't have a termination point. We don't know when it terminates. If you like, it just runs indefinitely. Um, but we can still use it, so I'll see you in the next step. But we, the, the purpose of this is to allow us to find values that have definitely been voted for by at least one correct node. So I guess my concern is just that the language you're using seems to obfuscate the underlying assumption that there can be a maximum of there can be only up to f faulty nodes, when in fact there could be more than f faulty nodes. Yeah, so it's like, it's like Bitcoin. If, Bit, if, if the amount of hashing power um, exceeds a certain amount, um, if, 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 if someone's got 51%, 50, 50, the network stops working. And, and this is similar. You know, if, if there are more, you know, if, if the Faulty nodes, um, sorry, if the adversary gains more than a third of the network, you can no longer reach consensus. So, and you're assuming that doesn't happen because of everything we talked about earlier with the Byzantine resistance, the yes, economic yeah, it's, costs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Say it's exactly the same as Bitcoin. You know, you, you're creating um, densities which have a resource associated with them. They're costly. So if you want to get more than a third of the network, you're going to have to invest a lot of um, money in, 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 in acquiring it. And there's different ways you can create civil resistant identities. It could be based on you know, just standard Bitcoin mining. It could be based on proof of stake models. Um, but you know, there's always going to, these, these protocols are always going to have a breaking point, right? I mean, at the very least, you know, if 100% of the nodes are faulty, right? Well, of course, how can you ever reach um, how can you ever reach cons sensible consensus? They can just do, do, do whatever they like. You know, if, if you've got 99% of the nodes are, are faulty, right? it's obvious you're not going to be able to have one node reaching consensus.
Uh, so then maybe, is, is there a reason why you're calling it a, a corrective? Maybe you could just call it, use some other terminology, uh, instead of calling it like, we received a, a correct vote, I'll say it just that we received F plus one votes, not necessarily labeling it as a correct vote. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's just terminology that comes from the space. Uh, it, 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 you typically classify nodes into correct and faulty nodes, and a correct node is a node that follows the protocol, um, and it's honest, yeah. and a faulty node is Byzantine, and it can do whatever it likes to try and break the protocol. It can corrupt data, go quiet, equivocate, you know, send people different copies of data, um, and anything it likes. Yeah. For, for clarity's sake, I would stick with his uh, vocabulary, but I would just assume that there's an external mechanism of enforcing that assumption. It, it tries to enforce it. It doesn't guarantee anything. I mean, in normal operation, of course, probably none of these nodes are going to be faulty. <coughs> but it's still you know, the protocol, is, in order to be safe, the protocol is still going to collect messages from a third of nodes before it amplifies them. And any message that has been correctly broadcast to all of the correct nodes, right, um, by this proportion will be amplified to a Byzantine quorum, right? 2F plus 1 is a Byzantine quorum, and that's, that's what the important part of this is. And the, this thing, when this thing runs, we end up with some accepted values that have been voted for by a Byzantine quorum of notes. Right? And we can use Byzantine quorum. Doesn't the word Byzantine mean like faulty? Yeah. So this is saying that we are achieving a faulty quorum. Seems confusing. No, a Byzantine quorum is a quorum that's large enough that if you have two Byzantine right. quorums, it will intersect in at least one correct node. So a normal quorum will intersect in. There's no, there's no uh, assumptions made about faulty nodes. There are no faulty nodes. So a normal quorum just intersects in one node. A Byzantine quorum must intersect in at least one correct node. So it means if you, if you, if you run two operations, both involving a, a Byzantine quorum of nodes, then there'll be at least one correct node that was that participated in both those operations. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this is why Byzantine quorums are kind of important. And this is really very kind of typical kind of sort of trick you have to, to play um, to make things happen. Where this is useful is that we're actually just looking at the values themselves rather than votes by a specific note. So um, this is the last kind of page of algorithms. Um, this is the, this is the um, uh, binary value consensus loop itself. And uh, you can see up here on line one, this node, node i has proposed a value. On line two, it assigns that value to its estimate. On line three, it initializes its round, the current communications round, to zero, and then it enters this loop. Um, and you know, see on line five, you know, you increment the round number each time. On line six, it's actually using um, that amplified binary broadcast algorithm to send out its estimate. Right. So on line six, it executes that broadcast uh, algorithm we were just looking at. Uh, and on line seven, it waits until it's got at least one accepted value, right? So once you set that thing, ADB broadcast going, it doesn't have a, a, a deterministic termination. It will just keep on running. So we just wait until we've got at least one uh, accepted value. So i.e., we've got a value that we know has been um, uh, broadcast by at least one correct node, right? By a Byzantine quarter of nodes. So on line eight, we um, uh, send out this vote for, for, um, for the accepted value to all the other nodes. So we rebroadcast we re, we re the first accepted value that we get. You'll see why in a second. And on line nine, we wait. And 
this is the kind of different, this is the kind of bits can be a bit difficult to get your head around. We wait until um, we um, receive. You can see what's happening up here, by the way. So you're sending it out on on on, on line eight. You can see over here and what like line one star. This is where we're receiving these votes, right? So here we're receiving a vote from node J, and uh, if um, if we haven't if we haven't received it, we are. Yeah, we're, we're, we're adding it to the, to the list of received votes. Um, so on line, line nine, we're waiting until we have received um, votes from a Byzantine quorum, right, from n minus f nodes. So we're waiting until we've received discrete votes from a Byzantine quorum of nodes. Where those, where those votes are in the accepted value sets, right? And because this is a Byzantine quorum, we get this interesting property that if, if, our set, if our set of votes only has a single value in it, we know that any other node that has a set of um, only has one value in its set of votes. That value is the same, has the same value. Now, it may be that, that other nodes have vote sets with two values, but, but where there's another node which has the same, you know, only has one value in its vote set, we know that it's the same. And, and the reason is that the accepted, um, the, 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 the values being voted for um, by the binary broadcast are, the, the accepted set contains the accepted set contains values that have been broadcast by the Zantic quorum. The votes contain values that um, have been broadcast by the Zantic quorum. So we know that we know that these nodes intersect in at least one node, right? Because it, because they're both. Both, both sets of values have been created by Byzantine quorum. We know they, they're intersect in at least one correct node. And we know that that correct node must have voted consistently. Right? And so consequently, we can do some cool stuff with that. So we get the common coin. So we just get coin, called common coin function. And this, of course, is, you know, just involves you know, broadcasting a threshold signature on the round number. Collect. Uh, Threshold signatures on two thirds the, the uh, uh, from two thirds of the nodes. You can combine them to create this deterministic <coughs> threshold signature. This is what generates the common coin. Here we're doing this check. So if we've got this single value in the votes, right, where that value is obviously in the accepted set two, if it equals one then we, we can do something special. If, if the value equals the coin, we, we can decide it. Um, and that's because we know it's consistent and, and, and things will converge. We then assign b to the estimate. The reason we can decide this is, in this particular case, there are, there are two situations. Either people have this one value, right? in their vote set. Either they have that one value in their vote set, or they have two values in their vote set. Right? And the great thing is, if they have two values in their vote set, I, it's, it's not one, right? They're coming down here, they're going to adopt the coin as their estimate. Right? And we're now going through the full set of explanation. Consequently, this is going to converge, right? And that's why right here we can just decide. This guy can just decide. Um, and, and you get out of this that the thing terminates in an expected number of four rounds. So typically you'll need like up to two rounds, maximum two rounds, to reach this state here. And 
then it's 50-50, right? All you need is the common coin and the, and the, and the votes to be the same, and you're out. You can, you can terminate. Uh, does the number of rounds depend on how big N is? No. Okay, and second question, how do you know what the value of N is? So, um, thinking back to the, uh, for example, Nakamoto identities, the first of the civil resistance identities. In that case, whoever solves a block on a Nakamoto chain can add a new identity alongside the coin base. So the blockchain will describe the valid identities. So the, the, the blockchain itself is just describes a distributed ledger. And it provides the registry, if you like, of valid identities. So every single node has a copy of the blockchain. And by examining the blockchain, you can see a record of all the, 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 the identities that are currently valid. And you can have, you know, obviously off that, you can have algorithms that structure your network and say, you know, these identities are going to do that, these identities are going to do that. But can't they lie about, can't they like create a, a new identity or, or choose to stick with the same identity? How do you know what, what they're doing? How, how could they create a new identity? The identity has to be in the, in the blockchain. So in order to create that identity, you, the same kind of resource has been expended as to create a new block I mean, when the coin base. So the identity is very expensive to create. Okay. And if the identity does something Byzantine, for example, um, you know, you, participants in these kind of protocols can log all the messages that they've received, and they can you know, occasionally exchange them using kind of various algorithms. And if they discover that some identity is, is for example, equivocating, they can create a cryptographic proof of that equivocation by combining two messages. So one thing I haven't talked about here is, is that these nodes have you like authenticated communication channels between them, right? Um, so off of those, you can create a cryptographic proof, cryptographic proof that some is equivocated. You can combine those. Uh, you can put that cryptographic proof into a transaction, post that to the, the blockchain, and now everybody who's um, who can see that blockchain can see that this this identity is is expelled and can no longer participate. It's an invalid identity. Have you considered how to oh, yeah. Turn. Have you considered how to um, cost the uh, to figure out how much it should cost uh, to create a new identity? It, because if, it, if if the if the reward of gaming the system is greater than the cost of creating a new identity, then they'll just create new identities at the game of the system. So, so the, this kind of protocol can be used uh, in, in a variety of network architectures. Um, it's possible to create a very simple uh, consensus-based cryptocurrency, for example, out of a combination of a Nakamoto blockchain and this kind of algorithm. And uh, in that kind of, and the advantage of that would just very simply be that you, you've got strong consistency, forward security, um, speed, that kind of thing, right? Um, and and, and in, in that kind of cryptocurrency, the, the Nakamoto blockchain would, would, would really just be there to enable the creation of civil proof identities and record multiple routes and things like that, right? That's a very simple design. Uh, a more complex design uh, might have, you know, be, be, be creating. Um, thousands of these consensus processes in order to, um, you know, uh, split up work. And these consensus processes may, uh, you know, be, be run by only a small number of nodes, like 10 nodes, and it's quite very likely, in fact, happen all, it'll happen all the time that an adversary has more than a third of the nodes and the consensus process fails. Um, so you have to have other parts of your network, uh, you know, architecture that that, that hand, you know, handle that, so you have to have systems of validation. Uh, I'll touch on that at the, at the end, is the transaction tiles. Um, so you, you can have trusted consensus and untrusted consensus. So yeah, we'll get to that in a second. And maybe I'll just, I'll just skip onto this because I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, oops, hold on. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples at the end to finish with. Uh, one, um, I'm afraid, is another algorithm. This is how you create certificates from threshold signatures. 
Um, so again, you know, without presupposing too much about how this is being used, um, you can imagine that uh, each node collects transactions during an epoch. Uh, each node, at the end of that epoch, creates a, tr a certificate for the transactions it's collected. And the certificate proves that a Byzantine quorum of nodes have seen and agreed the transactions. Right? And once all the nodes have created certificates for their transactions, the nodes can agree the collected data set using a, a parallel version of binary value consensus. And that's how proof of processing worked. Uh, so that's, this is how you, you create a certificate with a threshold signature scheme. It's very simple. Start here on line one. You propose a block B of transactions. Um, I'm assuming all the transactions have been shared here and they may not have. You, you, you take the hash of those transactions on line two. You then propose that hash to, to all the nodes. Here on line four, you can see what happens when, people, when node I receives, receives this proposal. Um, if, if node I considers that, that the, block, the block is valid, sorry, if node I considers, considers on line five that it's received the block and that the block is valid and that the hash of the block equals this BI thing, then it, 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 it creates a, a signature share um, on, on the message in knowledge with, the, 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 with this ID and, and the hash. And then it sends this uh, combination with the signature to, to back, back, doesn't broadcast, it sends it back. To no, 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 no. Line eight, um, it says, upon receiving this acknowledgement, nine, you verify that the signature share is valid. On 10, line 10, you, you um, add that uh, signature share into, into the sort of total of signature shares. And then once you've, on line 11, once you've reached, once you've, once, once you've collected a Byzantine quorum of signature shares, you then create a threshold signature. And um, you then broadcast, that's your certificate, you then broadcast it to another node. Right. So this is another way that you can use um, threshold signatures in, in decentralized networks. That's very useful. So for example, um, you know, imagine you've got a thousand nodes, right? And they're all collecting, uh, transactions independently. At the end of some epoch, they uh, want to agree what transactions they've independently collected, right? And so what they do is they all create these uh, certificates for their blocks of transactions, or it could be other data, it doesn't have to be transactions. And these certificates prove that a Byzantine quorum of nodes have seen this data and, 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 and accepted it uh, as input. So now, Right? You can then imagine that if you have a thousand nodes, you can imagine having a binary or 500 nodes, you can have a sort of binary string, it's like 63, 63 bytes or something, right? With 500 bits, and each bit um, that will be agreed represents whether the certificate, the values collected by each of the 500 nodes are, are going to be accepted or not by, by the group, right? One is accepted, zero is rejected, or not included. So this kind of thing is really, really useful. Um, last example technique um, is no efficient validation using randomness. So we've seen how randomness can be used for Byzantine consensus. We've seen how useful threshold signatures are. Um, lastly, we're just going to see that valid, uh, randomness is useful for validation too. And this uh, comes back to your question about how you um, validate the output. Um, because actually, you know, these D networks, there's three different requirements in a decentralized network. There's storage, there's validation, and there's consensus. Um, you've got to store the state, for example, like with smart contracts, that's going to be stored across the decentralized network. You've got to validate that the state transitions are correct, right? Because you can reach consensus on complete rubbish, right? So, anyway, how do we do validation? Um, so, today's validation technique is kind of strength in numbers. We have a large number of validators, right? So in the case of Bitcoin, it's all the nodes validate stuff, and um, you know it's 300,000 terahashes and uh, uh, hashing power and so on. It's kind of random actually. It's, it's what matters is it's the, the nodes on the network. Um, we might use I mean, we might have a consensus uh, network where we've got a thousand surety back nodes, and each each node has sort of 
burned a $25,000 deposit. Um, we could have another consensus network where we've got 1,000 puzzle towers, and each puzzle tower is backed by 100 terahashes of uh, mining resource, right? And the idea is that everybody just validates this stuff, right? Strength in numbers. Everybody validates everything. That's how we, we feel satisfied that we've got some truth. Um, but you know, there's, there's a better way, and transaction towers um, uh, kind of addresses this. So let's imagine we've got a storage group, we've got some kind of storage shard in our D network, and uh, transactions are sent to it, and it creates some data transitions that need to be validated, right? The, this storage group could, could pass this tr transition, the transaction and transition up to a transaction tower, right? And now, the, the transaction tower comprises of a number of levels of validation, right? And uh, each time new transactions come in, they're assigned to the tower, they're, they're put on the top in a new level. So let's imagine that there's a global randomness, and this could be a blockchain, and it selects uh, builder groups for each new tower level. So each, each new level of the tower is created by, um, for example, five nodes, just five nodes that are randomly selected. So here's the trick. When this group of five nodes um, creates this new level of the tower, they also have to validate 10 levels down. They can't just um, build a new level and ignore what's gone before. They have to validate 10 levels down before they add this, this new, new level. Um, and we say that a data transition is valid when it's been buried 10 levels deep. So only data transitions that are buried 10 levels deep in a, in a tower are considered valid. And, and this tower um, <coughs> proceeds in, in kind of lockstep with the chain, right? So if, if the tower stalls, then all of the data needs the full um, uh, validation depth again. So, um, so you know, an adversary, I mean, got each, each level's only like five nodes, right? So an adversary, can, will very regularly have his five nodes chosen to, uh, to um, build a new level of the tower. And if the randomness is left less than perfect, you know, somebody in the storage group might uh, introduce a, a, a bad transaction awarding the adversary you know, a million dollars or something, and he could predict that the next five, uh, the next five nodes are his own. And, and, and they agree, and they put in this, uh, they build this bad, bad level to the transaction tower. But the thing is, can the adversary also predict what the next five, who the next five nodes will be, right? Because if he can't, the next five nodes won't validate, won't be able to validate 10 levels down, and his tower is going to stall. And uh, if the tower stalls, you know, his nodes are going to become stuck, and he's lost all of that resource, and he's lost the surety, or he's lost the mining resource, or whatever it is. Um, and you know, the question is, you know, what chance does the adversary have of having five nodes chosen ten times in a row? Right, it's vanishingly small, right? It's just not going to happen. The adversary is never going to get that lucky that his five, you know, ten times in a row, five nodes are going to be selected at random. They're going to they're, they're going to validate, you know, ten levels deep in this tower, and uh, unless unless each time the five nodes are his, uh, you know, his yeah, his uh, bad transaction will be revealed. And so yeah, um, it, it's just not gonna happen. So anyway, the, the kind of point here is that actually with this kind of more intelligent approach to validation, you can achieve much better security with a much smaller number of nodes. So the current, the current approach is that you, know, you have a thousand nodes or the whole network even valid, validating everything. And it's actually possible to achieve a, 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 a equal levels of security validation with a much, much smaller number of nodes using randomness. Um, and that's the... What happens if some of the nodes are not available to be part of the tower? Yeah, so in that case, you can't distinguish between, um, uh, you can't distinguish between um, uh, you know, not being available and refusing to participate or whatever. So um, the thing stalls and you'd have to go down and someone would have to build, build deep, wouldn't have to build 
a large number of levels on top. So something that was currently um, five, buried five levels deep would now need an additional 10, 10 to become valid rather than five. So you're saying it would, you were trying to get other levels? Yeah. Yeah, the randomness. So you know, the, the, the thing continues in lockstep. So you're not able to. Um, so for example, imagine you're, you're, you know, the storage group puts in a bad node. Uh, sorry, puts in a bad transaction that awards the award the adversary a million dollars, and then he gets lucky and five of his nodes get chosen to build a level on the transaction tower. They do it. Now it's it, the the next group to build the next level gets chosen. But unfortunately, it's, it's not the adversary's nodes. So the adversary's nodes um, refuse to pass on the data that would enable the next group to validate what they've done. Because they can't pass it on, right? Because they're going to be discovered. Um, and so the way the system will deal with that kind of situation, it doesn't make any assumptions about what's happened. It just says, right, now, you know, there's going to be an additional 10 levels on top of this, right? And so something that's already buried um, one level deep goes back to requiring another 10 levels of validation. Um, and the, 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 node, the nodes that are unable to prove, you know, to supply that data to show that the thing that they validated was correct and to get it through the chain, stop, they're just stuck. And consequently, they're, they're economically redundant, they effectively lost the... Um, is it random or is it deterministic? How, the, the selection of the nodes? Yeah. So it has to be random. Yeah, it has to be random. It has to be random. So I'm, I'm pretty much done, actually. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> we've, done, we've covered a lot, I know. Uh, so, yeah. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Build some other thing that competes with Bitcoin or for the monetary purposes, or do you, are you building something that's smart platforms? And if, if it's the former, how do you get people to, to move across and coexist? Well, it's a good question. So, I mean, actually, um, Pebble started out as uh, it started out as a project to create a competitor um, that would be able to process microtransactions. That was a specific interest. Things like Internet of Things. Um, so um, then, then actually Pebble went off in a different direction and became interested in price stability and, and then eventually decentralized assets. Um, so the, a lot of the research is just done for its own sake. And it's, it's not necessarily pursuing cryptocurrency at all. So for example, there are, there are enterprise applications of this technology. If you look at the, 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 the investment banking sector, they spend I think like four billion a year or something crazy on um, settlement and clearing. And they might want to create a decentralized network amongst themselves to, 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 to remove that cost. So I think um, as time goes on, a lot of these decentralized technologies uh, will actually make their way into the enterprise. So there's lots and lots of applications of this kind of stuff that's outside of cryptocurrency. Um, and obviously with Bitcoin now, one of the interesting possibilities is that the, the, there's the sidechain systems coming online and people could potentially use these kind of technologies to create uh, you know, uh, uh, better, better versions of Bitcoin. So for example, there's always going to be this main, uh, main chain probably for a very long time. You could have a, I don't know quite how you'd integrate it, but you might imagine a Bitcoin system where um, the, the Bitcoin main chain is now creating identities, right? People who are solving blocks are also introducing identities and that somehow these identities are being used in a side chain that has strong consistency, forward security, you know, Processes the transactions in five seconds or less. Like the network, you could use, you could use this. Uh, then, well, they're not. Yeah, I mean, they're not really mutually exclusive. I mean, they're kind of um, Lightning Network is, is for a very specific use case, which is um, balance transfers, and balance transfers are cached on the network in hubs and then coalesced um, and consolidated so that there are fewer transactions. And yeah, it's a it's a valid technique. The the kind of stuff I'm looking at is you know just how you can actually I mean, Lightning Network reduces the amount of transactions you actually have to write to a blockchain. What I'm looking at is a different thing, which is how to increase the number of transactions you can actually write to a blockchain. 
Um, and there are some cases where obviously Lightning Network doesn't work. So if you've got like arbitrary, you know, smart contracts, right, you can't use it for that. So there's lots of, um, uh, you know, kind of like just more like a kind of distributed database kind of stuff. There's lots of things that you, you can't apply like Lightning like techniques. Um, so uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to credit is. Uh, I mean, this is just some of the precursors, right? But I, what I'm working on mostly in my like, spare time is um, how to uh, you know, design patterns for decentralized computing. So my objective is to produce um, a kind of set of theories and design patterns um, which are tunable. And you can say, right, this is the kind of decentralized network that I want to create. These are the characteristics that I need to have. And you can take the design patterns and the kind of uh, tool chest of individual techniques and algorithms and so on and so forth. And you can create the decentralized network you want. The decentralized network, you know, might be a cryptocurrency, it might be a smart contract system, it might be, you know, a decentralized settlement and clearing system for the investment banks. It, it, it could be anything. I think um, we're just at the beginning of this whole kind of decentralization uh, thing, and you know, we'll, we'll eventually see them used for all kinds of things. Yeah. We have time for one more question, and then we have to be out of there by nine. Um, so we have one more question. So I don't understand this as much as he does. But so can we go, go back to like the earlier slide that uh, there's like one more slide that uh, keep going. Sorry. Yeah. One more and uh, keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more slide, I think. Yes. And uh, for the broadcast, right? When, when the nodes uh, receive a message, does it broadcast to all the nodes that it connects to? And how many nodes does each one, each node connects to? Ah, so that's an interesting question, yeah. So you could run this over a broadcast, a peer-to-peer -peer broadcast network. Like a gas type? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think okay. people are going to develop much more sophisticated peer-to-peer -peer networks. So okay. they'll be more like switches. So you'll have multiple broadcast networks and messages will be routed onto one or another one of them. Because you can't, you, you, you can't scale a network where you've got a single broadcast network, right? Because every single transaction would have to travel over and get a million transactions a second where right, you get jammed off to just a few thousand. So I think in the end there'll be uh, the, the, the different kinds of push uh, So but then in that, but when they receive the message, they will broadcast whatever they received, right? And yeah, so you have to have, you might for example, okay, so yeah, so the, the group of nodes that were trying to reach Byzantium consensus uh -huh. might for example have their own peer-to-peer -peer network slice, mm -hmm. if you like. Does that make sense? That you know, the, the actual architecture of the peer-to-peer -peer network itself might be dynamic. And uh, you know, um, you might find like, you know, uh, you know, 10 consensus groups are on this slice and 10 consensus groups are on that slice, depending upon what the current architecture was. And the architecture would be continually changing uh, according to randomness. Yeah, but so I, I guess like, uh, but then let's say like so F nodes are forty, right? So one third of less than one third of nodes are forty. But then when a correct node receive a, a message from forty nodes, they will broadcast the forty value, right? Fourteen. Fourteen. Oh, sorry. The, the correct node when the correct node receive a incorrect message from uh, incor the forty. Ah, yeah, I then, see. Okay, yeah. Then wouldn't, that, wouldn't they actually broadcast the 40, uh, uh, the incorrect message? No, because what it does, it waits, it, 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 it's actually looking for a value, it's looking for a discrete okay. value, and it waits until it's got discrete values from f plus 1. Uh, and so f is the maximum number of volts, okay, the maximum okay. number of volts you have. And so we've got one more than the maximum number of volts you have, and consequently, you know we've got, you know we've got a value from at least one correct note. And then all of the correct notes that see f plus 1 will then um, amplify it, if you like. And if we then receive 2f, 2F if and only if we receive the value 2f plus 1 times, we know that all of the correct notes will, will agree on that. Not that moment, but eventually. So and then this actually, I'm sorry, that's going to be the uh, last question we have for today. Uh, you guys, if you want to continue the conversation.